Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first session on natural hazards. My name is Ann Cairns, and I'm Director of Strategic Communications and Outreach at AGU. I'm delighted to serve as moderator for this session on improving public safety. The need for good science as an input to policymaking is so readily apparent when we talk about public safety in the face of natural hazards. Our speakers this morning will talk about this from three vantage points. That of national emergency management, local and regional government, and the science that supports decision making. Our first speaker is Timothy Manning, Deputy Administrator of Protection and National Preparedness at FEMA. Tim is responsible for preparing the nation to protect against, respond to, and recover from natural disasters, as well as acts of terrorism. He oversees initiatives including training, education, exercises, assessment, and community preparedness. Tim brings to his work at FEMA almost two decades of frontline emergency management experience. He's a former firefighter, EMT, rescue mountaineer, hazardous material specialist, and hydrologist. Prior to joining FEMA, Tim was Secretary of the New Mexico Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. He also served as Homeland Security Advisor to Governor Richardson. Tim? It's great to be here with you all. Uh, I want to thank uh, the American Geophysical Union for putting this on. I think it's a, a fantastic track to what looks like a, a fantastic meeting. Uh, I had an opportunity to spend some time over in the posters, and there's some great information over there. I want to spend just a few minutes, if I may, discussing how recent uh, events, large-scale disasters, have been affecting uh, our disaster policy uh, at FEMA and across the emergency management and homeland security realms, um, and kind of more specifically how uh, you all in the scientific community can potentially help some of that. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing from my colleagues as well. Uh, I like to try to think of um, the, what we do in emergency management. Disasters uh, generally are the intersection of natural events or uh, extreme man-made events with, with the built environment. Um, a tornado in a farm field isn't a disaster necessarily, uh, while it may be an extreme uh, cl climate event. It doesn't, if it doesn't impact people, it's not really de facto a disaster. Specifically here, though, I'm going to think a little bit on the farther extremes, because we have been seeing stuff uh, over the last couple of years that I think has dramatically affected the way we think about disaster response, uh, mitigation, prevention, protection, uh, disaster preparedness writ large. Uh, I'll speak in a moment about this, but as a, uh, as a recovering geologist, uh, I'm, I appreciate you all letting me back in the room for a little while. Uh, I, I do have a, a fairly strange relationship with time uh, and time timelines. And we, we tend to think uh, in our line of work that we understand what is, what is possible, uh, what might happen as far as storms go, what might happen as far as, uh, as, far as earthquakes may happen, what is the attendant earthquake risk or, or for that matter, landslide, or whatever the, the natural hazard, uh, hazard, the hazard environment of our communities. We tend to like to think that we understand what that is. I, under, I believe that we don't really have any idea. Um, from a climate perspective, there's great work in paleoclimatology, but notwithstanding, our, our memories you know, are only a generation long, and our written record here in the United States only goes back a little over 100 years. And uh, you know, on a four and a half billion year old planet, that, that's not uh, a very good sample size. So we have uh, the intersection with these extreme events, or at least what we have been understanding uh, in emergency management over the last year to be very extreme. And then, of course, our kind of extreme engineering failures that may not necessarily be an extreme uh, geophysical event, could be a fairly minor geophysical event, or for that matter, no geophysical event, but a massive engineering failure that leads to uh, significant environmental impact, impact on, on the built environment and on human communities. Just in the last year, um, in 2011, we had the most disasters declared uh, in, in our history, in U.S. history, 99 presidential disaster declarations. But again, that goes back, that's a you know, couple hundred year old country, and FEMA and doing disasters, we've only been doing this way since 1979, so talk about a small sample size. But nonetheless, the largest number of disaster declarations um, in U.S. history, the largest dollar losses 
consecutively from a number of disasters that we've seen. 27 billion, roughly, in tornado damage alone. 553 people killed last year in 2011 from tornadoes alone, up from 45 the year before. And again, a tornado in, in not in a community isn't necessarily a disaster. We were unfortunate to have uh, large, uh, large magnitude, um, high wind tornadoes in communities in 2011 that we hadn't fortunately seen for some time. But nonetheless, we've seen the largest outbreaks, consistent outbreaks across the country uh, that we had on record. Just in, uh, and we've seen it again in 2012, the earliest damaging outbreak that we have on record. Earthquakes, another example. The Huku earthquake killed uh, roughly 16,000 people in Japan, injured another 30,000. An earthquake event and a tsunami in exceedance of record. In exceedance of the engineering mitigative steps, the protective measures that were put in the place based on the best science available and the public policy interpretation of that science, um, the natural event exceeded the design criteria uh, to tra tragic loss. Christchurch last year, earthquake, 6.3 ma moment magnitude earthquake that killed 185 people, 150, yes, 185, sorry. 185 people, six months after a seven-moment magnitude earthquake, on a fault that wasn't mapped in an area that nobody believed to have a high seismic risk. So uh, my colleagues tend to get a little tired with me talking about this, but you know, we, don't, we don't have record of something happening until it happens. It's a bit, uh, bit trite, but, but nonetheless, we don't know that there is a seismic risk until we identify a fault or until that earthquake ruptures. I was having this conversation with some of my colleagues not too long before uh, here in Washington, before an earthquake struck here, in exceedance of the magnitude and the energy release that we expected for something in Northern Virginia. It happens time and time again. Hurricane Katrina, a damaging, an, an, an amazingly intense hurricane, but nonetheless what caused the damage in New Orleans was an engineering failure. Uh, as much as any particular storm. The BP oil spill is another great example. So time and time again, we have these disasters, some call catastrophic disasters. But we have, what we have are events that exceed our expectations for those events in the environment in which they occur. And when those events exceed the, the magnitude in which we expect in that environment, Often our ability, our capability to respond to those, our preparatory actions that we took in, in leading into that are inadequate. We haven't built the necessary requirement or we hadn't prepared uh, for that particular, by definition, if it's in exceedance of what we expect, we wouldn't have prepared for that. And that leads towards concern that we haven't done quite enough. And if anything, we can recognize that after time and time again, of natural, both natural events and engineering failures exceeding our, ability, our expectations that we have greater uh, preparatory actions that we need to take. So one major change we've been making over the last year in public policy through Presidential Directive 8, Presidential Decision Directive 8, uh, kind of a rewriting of how we do national preparedness is a focus on capabilities uh, rather than specific hazard. When we identify, we write a plan for an earthquake in a particular area, we do our best to estimate what that earthquake might be and what the impacts might be, the magnitude might be, and we build around that. But if, it's there, if, it, if it deviates, pardon me, from in any way from there, often we're not able uh, to have the capability required to do it. So what we're taking is more of a, we call all hazard approach, we're taking, we're trying through the best science available, understanding what what could potentially happen, where, and how that might intersect the community, and building the capabilities to deal with the impacts of that, not the particular hazard. So we may be building the, the, the rescue, the heavy urban search and rescue capability to deal with the impacts of an earthquake, but our target for sheltering people may be the result of a riverine flood. Less specific as to what causes it, more specific into what we need to be doing about it. Um, we hope, we feel, uh, based on, on uh, hard lessons, that this is a more uh, appropriate way to apply the, the tools we have uh, to the problem at hand. And may I ask before I, I hand back over to my distinguished colleagues here, um, a, que a request of you all. Because in order for us to do that well, and more importantly to prepare the public uh, and 
take whatever potential changes to our communities to mitigate potential hazards that might be able to. We need the best science available. This last year, we saw NOAA issue 72 hours out from a particularly bad tornado outbreak, uh, a hazard warning for that community, something that had never been done that far out before. And 20, 48 hours, a severe advisory for that area, which turned into spawned uh, when the storm did grow, did develop, uh, an extremely and potentially deadly tornado outbreak. Um, we have better and more, more accurate forecasting uh, track maps and even intensity maps uh, for hurricanes than we've ever had before. The work that the USGS is doing in the, in the natural hazard track is providing us with data and an understanding of our communities better than we could have ever hoped 10 years ago. Um, and research, uh, just an article I was reading not too long ago in, in the um, geophysical letters in the AGU here about some work in Japan with, uh, with TEC uh, and some uh, information I'm potentially getting in the middle of uh, earthquake loop, earthquake event loops. And if nothing else, the work that's being done on trying to get, get inside the loop of the occurrence and the propagation speed of the seismic waves and being able to get uh, speed of light warning out and stopping elevators and stopping bullet trains uh, and that sort of things. Good science leads to uh, lives saved. And so uh, the more work that we do in that regard, uh, the better off we all are. So I thank you for what you have been doing, and I encourage you to do even more. And on behalf of my colleagues uh, and all those former geoscientists that have uh, moved into public policy, uh, I, I thank you for letting me be here, uh, and I appreciate the work you're doing, uh, and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Our second speaker is Marsha McNutt, director of the U.S. Geological Survey. USGS is the nation's largest water, earth, biological science, and civilian mapping agency. Its mission is to provide scientific data that enable decision makers to create sound policy. Dr. McNutt holds a, direct, a doctorate in earth sciences from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. She was awarded AGU's McElwain Medal in 1988 for research accomplishments by a young scientist. And she also received the Morris Ewing Medal in 2007 for her contributions to deep sea exploration. Before her appointment at USGS, Dr. McNutt taught at MIT for 15 years, and she served as director of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. As you've heard, USGS is a science mission agency. So what does that mean? For the USGS, it means that we have no management and we have no policy responsibilities. But we do have certain delegated authorities in the hazards area for protecting life and property. Specifically, we have the delegated federal responsibility to provide notifications and warnings for earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and landslides. Our stream gauges and our storm surge monitors support NOAA's flood and severe uh, weather warnings, including those for hurricanes. Our geomagnetic observatories support NOAA and the Air Force geomagnetic storm uh, forecasts. The USGS has a key role in tracking zoonotic diseases. And uh, I don't think uh, many people are aware of the fact that all major pandemics to date have been caused by diseases that have moved from animal hosts to humans. And that includes the Black Death, the Spanish influenza, HIV AIDS, H1N1, SARS, and Ebola. And that list should literally make your blood run cold. And USGS runs in its um, Madison uh, Biological Lab, what is the CDC for animal health. And therefore, we will be the first line of defense for finding die-offs of wildlife that could be the next wildlife disease that could move from animal hosts to humans. We also... Um, 
run a number of programs in uh, mapping and observations that support response for wildlife fire and many other disasters, including through our Landsat satellite program and through unmanned uh, air support um, using actually um, decommissioned um, unmanned uh, air uh, drones that we now uh, run in the civilian mode. And our seismic networks support NOAA's tsunami warnings as well. Um, I want to give a shout out to all the USGS posters um, on hurricane, tsunami, and other hazards work that you can see over in the poster area today. So um, USGS works uh, in many partnerships with the academic community uh, to turn research into operational tools and products that can guide uh, policy decisions and inform the public. Um, it's uh, true that the academic community has a hard time supporting long-term monitoring, such as uh, seismic networks or stream gauge networks, and it can't assume the liability for um, uh, operational functions, such as earthquake early warnings, um, which, and I think both of those are examples of legitimate government functions that an organization like the USGS has the responsibility to provide for uh, public safety of lives and property. So let me give you a couple examples, mostly drawn from our earthquake program, of how the USGS is working with the academic community to take a lot of their research products, turn them into operational tools, and then work with other government agencies, such as FEMA, to help reduce loss of lives and property. So for example, um, we work with uh, the academic community, um, and uh, I was out in the Los Angeles area just uh, a couple, uh, maybe about a month ago, on the rollout of a demonstration of earthquake early warning in uh, Los Angeles. And so now the um, Emergency Operations Center in Los Angeles has now earthquake early warning such that should an earthquake occur anywhere in the California area, there will be a notification that comes to the Emergency Operations Center and a countdown starts going on a big screen there to uh, notify them that an earthquake has occurred on one of the faults in California, and the clock shows when the severe ground shaking is going to arrive in the Los Angeles area. Now, all the USGS does is let them know how much time they have until the ground shaking arrives. And when we rolled out this um, demonstration, we had with us in the room at the operations center, um, leaders from the public sector, the private sector, nonprofits, so that they could decide what they would do with this information if they decided to bring it in to their spheres of influence. People from Disney, people from banks, uh, people from um, the retailers. Um, for example, um, the gentleman from Disney said, I'm probably going to stop Space Mountain. Um, people from um, hospitals were deciding what they would do with that information. Uh, people from uh, banks decided what they would do with that information. And it's not up to the USGS to get in other people's business models to decide what are they going to do with 10, 15, 20 seconds worth of warning. But um, we can, it is um, our business to say, how much time can we give you? And your business to say, what will you do with it? Um, and we're also working with the academic community to improve the rigor of that information. Can we give them um, more precise information and make that information more robust by improving the models 
for the slip on the faults. Um, so that it's not just a point source model, it's actually a, a finite slip model. And so we're working with Berkeley, with Caltech, with USC, uh, and uh, with other universities in the area to improve the models. And that is how USGS can be the government agency that helps um, move new information from the research community into operations and help uh, save lives and property. Now, we're also trying to be on the forefront of um, new technologies such as social media. And um, when you think of it, a natural hazardous event only becomes a human catastrophe because people are in harm's way. And with more than six billion of us on the planet, that puts a lot of people in harm's way. And to turn this around, that means a lot of us can effectively become sensors. And a lot of us have smartphones and computers, and those computers have shock sensors in them, which are effectively accelerometers. So we started thinking within the USGS, how can we turn everyone's computer into a seismic sensor? So Elizabeth Cochran, one of our young and very brilliant seismometers, has developed something called the Quake Catcher Network to turn everyone's computer into a low-cost seismic sensor and network them all together, all you need is wireless, and to collect that information from everyone's laptop computer to add to the information that we have out there to um, understand more about uh, where earthquakes are happening and um, how severe the impacts are. We're also collecting information from uh, Twitter. For example, the first way we knew that there had been an earthquake in Haiti was from a tweet that came out of Port-au-Prince because there was not a functioning seismometer in the entire nation of Haiti. The closest functioning seismometer was actually in the Dominican Republic. And because that tweet came in at the speed of light from Haiti, that came in faster than the seismic information came from the Dominican Republic. So actually, um, information from humans getting online can be valuable information when it comes in immediately. Another good example of that is the Virginia earthquake. How many of you experienced the Virginia earthquake here? All right. Well, because that earthquake was so rare, and Tim told you about how rare and, and unusual that uh, earthquake was, the first information that came out of um, USGS through uh, PAGER, and PAGER is Prompt Assessment of Global uh, Earthquake Response, and it's a very important tool that we put out. It's an important tool for FEMA because it puts out immediate information within minutes of the earthquake that says, on a logarithmic scale, how many casualties are there and what's the economic impact of it? It can immediately tell the State Department, FEMA, uh, the Red Cross, other uh, first responders, is this a local um, emergency, is it a national emergency, or is it an international emergency? And because we didn't have much experience with an earthquake um, in this part of the country, Pager did a very simple analysis that showed sort of concentric circles around mineral Virginia um, showing um, loss estimates that showed immediately around mineral there would probably be a lot of damage and the damage um, very quickly going to um, lesser amounts as you went away from mineral. Well, people, people like you and me, including especially me, immediately got on the did you feel it 
web page for USGS and started putting in their um, uh, response to the earthquake and said, hey, I'm in Foggy Bottom, and this is what I'm feeling, and I'm in Alexandria, and this is what happened, and I'm at the National Cathedral, and there are spires falling down. And Pager, without any interaction with human beings, immediately updated its loss estimates based on the interaction with human beings as sensors coming in through the Did You Feel It network. And suddenly, Pager, rather being concentric circles, became a sausage. A sausage of damage estimates going out to the D.C. metro area and out into uh, Chesapeake Bay, showing the directionality of that earthquake. So humans as sensors and um, social media, the way of the future. So I'll end there. Our third speaker is Kristen Jacobs, Vice Mayor of Broward County, Florida. Kristen serves on the Broward Metropolitan Planning Organization. She also chairs the South Florida Regional Transportation Authority and the Broward County Climate Change Task Force. Kristen has brought issues such as water conservation, smart public transit, and climate change to the forefront of public attention in championing the quality of life in Broward County. At the national level, she chairs the Energy Committee for the National Association of Counties. She's testified on Capitol Hill on environmental and water quality issues. And she was recently selected as chair of the White House National Ocean Council Governance Coordinating Committee. Kristen? Well, hello, everybody. You know, it's interesting being a native of California to, uh, to talk about earthquakes when I was a kid. They were so commonplace in San Diego where I grew up that during dinner when one would happen, my dad would say, earthquake, everybody up. We'd go stand around the yard, little kids, and then come back in when it was over. I never thought much of them. And then having moved to Florida where our natural disasters are of a total different sort. Um, and while we may have a lot of warning for hurricane, hurricanes, there are so many challenges for Florida as a state and South Florida in particular. It's one of those things that I've gotten very involved in. I'm pleased to be able to come talk to you today about what's been happening in the, in the state of Florida, what's happening in South Florida, and more particularly, how by working together through various regions, putting our uh, competition or competitive natures aside, um, we've been able to reach out and have a reach back by the federal and state government that has really helped us in advancing uh, the issues that are facing us in South Florida. So what makes South Florida so vulnerable? Well, the fact that most all of the South Florida area sits about three feet above sea level. Down in Monroe County at the very southern end of the state where the Keys are, most of that area is right at sea level. We have a peninsula that's about 1,800 miles of coastline, the longest coastline in the continental United States. Recently, there was a study that came out by Swiss Re, the reinsurers, that looked around the planet to see and identify the top 20 cities most vulnerable to sea level rise. And it isn't surprising that when they looked at number of assets at risk to sea level rise, the Miami-Dade metro area in South Florida was number one, and that includes Broward County. When they looked at areas at risk to population, we were number seven. So there are huge issues for us in trying to understand what's happening with sea level rise and how we can begin to deal with it. The things that are at stake are just huge for our area. First of all, not only are we very low-lying, but we also receive our water from the Biscayne Aquifer, which is anywhere from a couple of inches at the surface to about 100 feet. Um, more than 5 million residents depend on this as a fresh water supply. Sea level rise has also been causing a lot of issues for us with a saltwater intrusion line. And you'll see this is Broward County uh, proper. What you don't see in this picture is that Broward County is two-thirds Everglades. So if you go to the west, another two-thirds the width of what you have here. Uh, you'll, you'll see how large the footprint of our county is, but the urbanized area is all crowded in. Um, we have 1,800 linear miles of canal systems that were created to drain the water off so that people could live there. We are on the west 
west side, the Everglades, which is always seeping into the urbanized area, and that water gets back pumped out. And then um, the ocean, of course, on our east side. The red line is the saltwater intrusion line that is moving ever inland. And if you notice that it's kind of got a little belly shaped there around the city of Fort Lauderdale, if you were to go and map out, which you can't see in this map, but where our salinity structures are, you'll see that the sea lab, the saltwater intrusion line is pretty much following the, the salinity structures. And the furthest inland one is six miles, and the closest to the ocean is three miles. Um, we have already had many instances where uh, the wells, all basically the wells on the east side of that red line have already had to be shut down. Interestingly enough, at the north part of the county, where it was once thought once sea level moves into and you lose your freshwater uh, wells that you can never get them back, in an experiment where we started to uber hydrate the, the residential area with uh, reuse water while reducing the amount of water they were pulling out of those wells and pulling water more from the western wells, we were actually able to move the salt li water line back toward the coast. However, it takes about 10 times uh, the length of time to move it back as it did for it to move in. So it's certainly not a solution, but we know that it's one of the ways in which we can begin to deal with what's happening. Um, as I said, Florida, South Florida in particular, is actively managed um, for critical flood protection. Because of our low elevations, we have been made developable by draining our land, digging miles and miles of canals, and removing moving the water through a series of pumps. The drainage infrastructure, which, um, which protects the millions of people that are in Broward County, in fact, we're 1.8 million people in just our county alone, is hugely susceptible to sea level rise. Um, sea level rise is not just a concern for, for us in South Florida, but to all of the coastal areas in Florida. That risk is expected to rise by 25% over the next 20 years. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is one of your typical Fort Lauderdale houses. There is a canal on the back of it. At the bottom right of the screen, you can see the storm drain there. And this is an example of the way our drainage systems work in almost all of South Florida. That is, water runs downhill, um, including our uh, sewage systems is 60% gravity fed. So you have water, the house sits, as you can see the green yard, the house sits up higher, the water hits the yard, it rolls down into the storm drain, goes through the pipe and goes into the intercoastal or into any one of our uh, tertiary, secondary, primary canal systems and is either back pumped to the Everglades or in this case goes out to the intercoastal waterway. But lately, due just to tide, this is not due to a rain event. This is a homeowner whose uh, storm drain is not working anymore because sea level rise has caused that very system that was created to drain water off to in fact become a conduit for seawater to come in. So you can see as the salt water begins or sea level rise begins to come up, it clogs up the drain. The drain is no longer going to function, and so we have this backup. This, again, was a non-rain event. This is just simply due to tide. In Broward County, this happens multiple times a year when we have a, um, a full moon. In the Keys, however, it's happening twice daily with the tidal movements. It is happening so often in, in Monroe County that Ford Motor Company will no longer honor the warranty to their police vehicles due to saltwater damage and the undercarrier uh, carriage of the cars and their fire hydrants are rusting away in the streets. So when, when we walk the hill up here and we talk about sea level rise and climate change, we're not kidding. We really know and are seeing firsthand what's happening. What's really scary, though, is when you combine a high tide event and the sea coming in through all of our drainage structure, and then you combine it with a rain event. And so what happened was we had a lot of rainfall, as does happen in South Florida, and the drainage system was simply not working, and so we had no ability to move this water out. It is increasingly becoming a problem for us. Um, when those drains aren't working, high tide is up. We have water that is now ponding in many areas of the county that can stick or hang around for um, as far as a week and even in two weeks time. It's quite problematic. So we know that we're vulnerable. We know that, um, that the, the climate scientists are telling us that we are not going to so much have more hurricanes, but we are going to have hurricanes of greater intensity in the years that come. And we know that when that happens, the issues that are, the, that are subject to storm surge and coastal flooding is going to be even greater. And on the right side, you can see where our storm surge zones are. 
That isn't just water that's washing up on shore, but it's feeding its way inland by virtue of all of the canal systems. What you don't see in this picture on the right is that the western side of the county can't drain either because it's using the existing canal system to pour its water off and eventually have it go out to tide out to the ocean or it's back pumped into the Everglades. So when we have these storm surges, what's been happening is extreme beach erosion. It's been a real problem for Broward County and all of South Florida. Finding the dollars to, um, to rebuild our beaches are hard to come by, um, but they are an increasingly important part of protecting us and inland properties from the effects of, of wave action. Um, so local governments have been making a lot of investments, Broward County in particular, in our planning tools or policy development and technical tools to address and try to adapt to a changing climate for us. Um, many of these major accomplishments that we have made, we could not have done if we were working on it simply on our own. Um, Broward County joined with Miami-Dade, Palm Beach, and Monroe County to create the Climate Change Compact. It's the, we are the only counties in the United States that have managed to do this. We're in our fourth year. We have signed a compact formally agreeing to the exact same language for our state and federal legislative packages. And I have to tell you, given the competition between our counties, all three of the large, we represent all three of the largest counties, Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade. We all have our own airport. We all have a seaport. We have a huge economic and marine interest in competition with one another. But we knew that in facing the issues that we were and trying to get the attention of the federal government. We weren't going to get there if we struck out on our own and that we needed to come together and speak in one voice. And that's exactly what's been going on. Um, by, the, by the four counties working together, we were able recently to get climate action, adaptation action areas adopted into Florida law and are working actively to see it adapted on, um, adopted on a national level. We were also able to incorporate sea level rise into our emergency management and local mitigation strategies. So I love this slide because it's, I know it's very boring, but look at all of our partners. We're not doing this alone. What is interesting as a local government representative is generally the federal government says to you, you're too difficult to deal with, you're too small, and we'll just give the money to the states. And for anyone in the room that is with a local city or county government knows that when the money goes to the state, you never see it roll downhill to us. And we are the ones who are dealing with all of these issues. We are the ones that have to find a way to get around all of these problems because when disasters happen, we have to rely on ourselves first, long, long before we can rely on others to come help us. So understanding where we are and where we need to go has been a huge um, advance for all of our counties to have the kind of partners that we have. The inundation maps that have been um, um, worked on now are the direct outflow of the work from NOAA, the South Florida Water Management District that have helped us um, and many other GIS experts in the four counties to develop a method where we can uh, perform inundation mapping and understand our, our uh, vulnerabilities and these maps have been set at both one, two, um, one, two and three foot uh, scenario so that we can identify the areas of most concern. Several of the counties are working with USGS uh, to develop even more advanced hydrologic models so that we can understand how sea level rise is going to affect saltwater intrusion into our drinking water, our drainage infrastructure, the major port facilities and um, also the influence on our groundwater levels. So while our region has made significant levels uh, strides forward, we still require more sophisticated models. We still have a lot of work to do. There are a lot of tools that are coming our way by virtue of the four counties coming together in such an important way. We really couldn't have gotten as far as we, we have so far if it weren't for the federal government jumping in and helping us and using uh, their expertise and lending it to us in the, in the uh, aggressive way that they have. Um, but funding is always an issue. While we're working together, we're able to cost share those those impacts of dollars, but we know that there are always, as there is up here in Washington, attacks on budgets, and particularly some of those budgets now, Army Corps of Engineers is hugely important to forward strides in Broward County and the South Florida area, and including NOAA, some of the discussions to tuck NOAA under the Department of the Interior, where we fear that should that happen, there might not be the kind of funds to that agency that they once had, and that that might impact us negatively. So we are very much watching what's going on. 
particularly in the areas of beach renourishment. Um, these are very, very expensive projects. The beach renourishment project that Broward County is currently engaging in in one county is over $17 million. We've been reimbursed by the federal government on that project, only $5 million, and the last $9 million was a check about to be written last year when there were uh, uh, all kinds of flooding and problems going on in the rest of the country, and that my $9 million reimbursement to our county went to the middle of the country. And while we don't begrudge them their dollars, they needed them. The point was we really needed to be reimbursed for those dollars. So continuing to find the dollars that we need is really, uh, really important. The, one of the last things I wanted to leave with you is that FEMA is now designating coastal V zones, which recognize wave impacts on coastal communities. Um, but in, in where we are in the South Florida area, these maps are not coordinated wet yet with the issues associated with sea level rise. And we really are concerned about the direction that that's going uh, and want to be able to influence that and that those, those kinds of, of efforts that are going on. We have um, been encouraged by our conversations and know that at some point we're going to find the kind of solutions that we need as a county. And finally, I wanted to leave with you that there are 23 states that have been identified as being vulnerable to sea level rise and more, and with more than half of the United States population living in a coastal city, that's a really big deal. There are a lot of needs out there, not to say that South Florida's are any greater than others, but as a local representative for a county with 1.8 million people, and in fact, the four compact counties together represent a population greater than 30 states, we tend to think that uh, our issues are the biggest ones out there. So what I wanted to leave with you today, the takeaway, is that there are, um, there are a lot of costs, there are a lot of unknowns coming our way, but the one thing that we can be sure of, there's not going to be enough money to deal with all of these issues, particularly for local government, as these things continue to come up and confront us, and that by working together as local communities, being more and more self-reliant, and being able to come together in a formal way to take advantage of those services and those monies and those expertise uh, levels that the federal government has, we are enriched by that process. We are inherently safer when we work together. And, uh, and I thank you all for having me here today. Thanks. So thank you all for your great participation in the conversation starters. And thank you to our panelists, Tim, Marsha, and Kristen. We really appreciate your being here and sharing your experience and perspectives with us on this subject.